Second video um, to the exhibit that we have here by Claude Desir, a solo exhibit. Uh, we're here um, today to talk about the support materials and the supporting art that talks about why we chose blackface, um, memorabilia, black Americana, and to present this in a public forum. And I have to thank Ayaba Ibo Mandingo, a colleague and um, a friend who we have, you know, gone through our own discussions here on this very sensitive topic of race and understanding, misunderstandings, different perspectives. And he's been a great guy to help us with this show. And so, uh, yeah, but what, you know, I talk about how with us, when we, when we approached a difficult conversation, I felt a sense of risk mm -hmm. and a little bit of maybe of, maybe intimidation that I didn't want to offend or also seem stupid or insensitive. And I feel like those are some of the same experiences I had with this show, but something in my gut told me that we have this show by Claude that talks about blackface. And unfortunately, I think there are people who are either too young or maybe not aware or didn't realize how pervasive this imagery is and the impact it's made for centuries um, on black people and then the perception that we all have of people with African features mm -hmm. and dark skin. So what are your feelings about why we did this part of the exhibit? Well, um, I, I think from, I guess from the other side, I, I, I can't, I, I've always approached the subject with, with that same trepidation because you don't want to step on toes, not necessarily um, from my point of view for, for um, nervous, I, I think more, um, not wanting people to think that I'm beating them over the head with, 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 uh, with my story and my struggle and my plight and my this and my that. Um, but I still think it's important because I think that the issue is the conversation. I think that because we won't have this conversation, when I say we, I mean black people and white people in this country, because we won't have this conversation, it just keeps on bleeding into other generations. Mm -hmm. And the confusion and, and the stereotypes and the assumptions and the presumptions they just keep getting added to it. So. We have to, and so I think I think you and I are the perfect kind of people to talk about this because I think the basis of our relationship that started as you know, an artist and a gallery owner and a curator and, and has become friends is has been this kind of honesty that's been raw to the point where there are times when we kind of give we got to give each other a couple of days long to, to not talk because but that's one of the things I respect and love about you is that you're honest enough and you want to. You want to. I think that's the difference between everybody's talking about what America's going on. I think the main thing everybody better remember is that we better want to, because 70 million people voted for Trump. Yes. So we better want to, because it's great to, to put this thing forward, like uh, uh, us talking about the idea of America. I think it's, why do I stay being an immigrant? Because I think the idea of America is the greatest one ever put forth when it comes to societies. And I study history. I don't know of one in history where people say, mm -hmm. let's get together. Let's have everybody from everywhere come and it will make gumbo out of all of our differences. And, and the idea of that, granted it hasn't been allowed to happen in America, but I think it's because we haven't had this conversation. Mm -hmm. right. You know, the thing, blackface, blackface once upon a time, that was 100 years ago, it was an opportunity to have this conversation. We didn't, and we literally can sit back and look at 100 years of the consequences of not having this conversation. Right, you know, when we talk about history, I just want to say the day that we're shooting this video, is the day that there was the transference of power from Donald Trump to um, um, Joe Biden, mm -hmm. which is kind of a momentous day. And we know that a few weeks ago was the time when there was the breach of Capitol Hill. And we're gonna get to all that mm -hmm. when we're talking uh, about this. And, and you know, as we talk about this, where we, why do we need to discuss it? Um, one of the things in, we have a lot of essays that we wrote, I mean, we thought deliberately and sincerely about this and did research and have support materials that all be on our website. You know, one of the ideas that I realized was, and I've read about it too, is that this is a wound. This is an infection, like a virus, that needs to be lanced and then needs to be healed. And yes. when you lance it, all that stuff's gonna, it's come, gonna up. come up. It's like on Capitol yes. Hill, it's right? It's gonna stink, and it's gonna get on stuff, and it's not gonna be nice to mm -hmm. clean up, but. It's, it's going to be out, and I, and I agree with that. Mm -hmm. So provocative art can be the sword and the salve, and that's really what the concept 
of this show is about. So we have some things here. Maybe it's an opportunity now for us to talk about individual things. We have some of the blackface Americana memorabilia, mm -hmm. and we also have your artwork. And then we also have some panels that are teaching panels. So I'm just going to let you go. I know we have things here on Birth of a Nation that we talked about. So Ayaba, thank God, is a historian <laughs> and so well learned that you know I want him to share some of that information with you. Well, um, so for me, why is this why is this important for us to talk about this stuff? Because we now live in probably more so than any other time in history. We live in a time where the things that we do, the clothes we put on, the foods we eat come from things that we upload from outside sources, the television, especially our kids. You know, you, you could literally in November, by September actually, if you have young kids, you can pretty much watch what they're watching on TV to know what they want for Christmas without asking them, just by watching how they react when the commercials come on. And that upload and that propaganda, that, that bombarding of your senses, that's always been true. It's not digital now, so it happens quick, but a hundred years ago, print, this is what print ads did. You know, Aunt Jemima, all those kind of things were used, and that was somebody's making a decision, people in power, to say, let's portray these people this way. And this is a person like Mitch McConnell. That's, that's how his father, that's the, the childhood, his father grew up in that, in that way. So when you think about it, it's not, a, it's not an excuse, but you understand the context of how these people were raised and what was put into their head. Like me, I, I'm from the Caribbean, I've, I've been here for 40 years. And I still love the smell of a, van, of a mango and a guava because those 11 years of my childhood, that's what was uploaded into me. So that's still my favorite fruit. It's still tropical. You know what I'm saying? The, the, the things that my kids, like, you know, dukana that, that have, they look strange and they taste strange if you're not from the Caribbean. My kids don't, they had to like, learn to like that stuff. For me, when my mother said she's cooking dukana, I have a freezer and send them airmail to me from <laughs> all the way from Virginia because they're they're my childhood. Mm -hmm. So if you apply that same idea to a hundred years ago, this is what white kids saw growing up. They saw the big lips and they saw the caricatures of black people talking and bouncing around and then shucking and jiving. And their their assumption naturally is to think that just like a kid thinks Santa Claus is real until he comes to the point and realizes that mom and dad is Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was uploaded. So who was Jim Crow? Can you talk about well, that? Well, I think J Jim Crow was, was a propaganda machine. He, he was American apartheid. And it, it, it's, you know, you have, you have the Civil War, and the Civil War led to Reconstruction, which was an opportunity for America to reconcile. Mm -hmm. And you had a weak president in Johnson, who was um, Lincoln's vice president, who succumbed to the pressure of the South because he was from the South, just like, just like we see today. Mm -hmm. and, and the way politicians are pulled and, and, and maneuvered and, and maligned. Right. And but when you talked about um, propaganda and print and things like that, Jim Crow was actually a minstrel, right? Yes, well, it was it was a, it was the like sort of an amalgamation of all the all of these characters made into this thing that becomes this, this character mm -hmm. that we see, this right Jim Crow guy right. that we see, and it, it what it represented was a mindset, mm -hmm. like Jim Crow meant apartheid. You know, Jim Crow was was the the, the Northern Army moving out of the South, occupying the South. To, to, to make sure that the, the white men behave themselves. Mm -hmm. and the minute they left, and within weeks, all the black senators, mayors, homeowners, they were all chased out. And then this, this mentality was put on America, which was Jim Crow. And Jim Crow came with exactly like, the, I'm sure that white men must have, must have sat around, because it was white men who could vote and who owned property, sat around and said, well, what is this gonna look like? And they got artists, they hired artists, and somebody like, uh, um, uh, but his name is going to jump out of my head. That did F, uh, Nick Birth of a Nation. Who D W Griffin. D W Griffin, who was basically the father of of modern cinema. He invented that whole idea of of, 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 of well, talkies, but also all different ideas that Hollywood still uses. He created, mm -hmm. and he used that sort of genius to basically get revenge for his dad, for lack of a better way, because his father was a Southern general who lost, who was a Civil War ah. and, that, that lost, lieutenant rather, and so he made this movie completely mm -hmm. telling us his version of the movie, right. of what the South was. And he used a black man to play the black man because he didn't want a black guy to play it because he needed the black guy to be his version of a black guy. So he couldn't trust that a black guy might do something that they don't think a black guy should do. So he had a black guy, a white guy, put on the black thing. To be the mulatto character right. that No, the, 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 the rapist that, that's, that's caught in how many end of the movie, he was, and he, he, you know, this oh. is sort of maybe the first time we see this, right, this right, idea right. of blackface. He does it in Woodrow Wilson's uh, uh, White House, 
He mm -hmm. says it was like watching history written, being written with a lightning right. bolt. He gave it a thumbs up. Um, mm -hmm. It was the first blockbuster movie. Right. And we're talking 100 years ago, roughly. So, so this yeah, is what, this is what, the kids are like, can you imagine the kid on that? Hey, Dad, can we go see the movie? And then you see little Mitch McConnell at seven years old watching this. So let's, what else is he gonna think let's contextualize night, the movie. It's 1915 right. or so. And uh, it talks about reconstructionism, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the point of view is that um, the black people that are freed are now getting too powerful mm -hmm. and maybe even potentially violent mm -hmm. and a risk. And so therefore, who has to come in and save the day? The and who is Klan. glorified? The, the Ku Klux, Klux Klan. Klan right? And they, they were basically invented. The mm -hmm. Ku Klux Klan was invented to police that. I mean, you, if, you, if you're paying attention, you hear the, the foundation of the 20th century being constructed mm -hmm. right in front of you. You see yeah. it happening. That's exactly what we're looking at what happened. And so this film was screened as a debut mm -hmm. in the White House when Woodrow Wilson was president. Mm -hmm. He campaigned against Theodore Roosevelt, right. who ran on a pro, called the Progressive Third Party candidate, the mm -hmm. Bull Moose Party. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you'll see we have a pound in um, research, a poster of the Ku Klux Klan fighting voter fraud. Yes. All of this, does it sound all, really familiar? All of What's repeating. been happening just now? Not to mention, yeah. the, the main thing, I think probably, what, what, Roosevelt, he's gonna be remembered for, for uh, his treks through South America and all the things that he conquered. But he's also gonna be remembered for busting up monopolies. Gee, that sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. Trillionaire is about to happen. Right. So to me, the cycle, the circular alertness yeah. of the madness is, is also kind of scary because we're literally right back into those type of situations again. And the race, the racial yeah. issues are are probably maybe not as not as obvious, but they're still there. Right. And then, so you go, wow. So for me, the fact that a young man who's younger than both of us, Claude, can pick up in that on that aesthetic and be brave enough to not right. to, to not even like cloak it. Right. It's really bold and it's really unavoidable and, and, and to me, I think that's awesome. And I just want to say that when we opened the show a week ago, we had a lot of Claude's friends coming in. They all came in um, physically distanced. We had them time. We didn't have a lot of people here. They all wore a mask. But we asked them to give us their comments and we wrote them, we were writing them down on the board here um, because we wanted to know, you know, did we cross the line? Mm -hmm. did we, are we offending? And, I have to say, I don't think anybody told us that it wasn't the, I'm not going to say right or wrong, but that it needed to be shown, at least, is what uh, I would say yeah. we came across. And it's generational. You know, like like somebody, like somebody from my grandfather's generation, they're not going to like it. No. They're going to be offended. Mm -hmm. They're going to want it down. They're going to give you a hard time. Because for them, it's not the sort of once removed thing. This is what, you know, my, somebody like my grandfather, mm -hmm. this is what he saw mm -hmm. when he was called a nigger. And then they put up this poster of a nigger. That's this is you. Yeah. It, the correlation is not. They don't have to remember. This is how I grew up. This is what the reason I became Jackie Robinson is because I was trying to defeat this that I saw every day of my boyhood growing up. I I, I wanted to defy this interpretation of me. Mm -hmm. You know. So to, so the, the the closeness of it for them you get it. But when you get to Claude now, who, who would be like my great my grandfather's great grandson, because Claude, I have children his age. You know what I'm saying? So for him to revisit that, I love that he calls it regret. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's what it is. You know, a lot of times I, I, I'm a writer and I don't think I don't think any word should be censored. So I use nigger N I G G E R and N I G G A when when I needed to say something because that's what it said. And I like the idea that Black intellectuals and black poets and artists talk about taking that word back because you can't take something and, and, and take the fangs from it and rebrand it and make it another word and make it have another meaning. Like, you know, a hundred and something years ago, gay meant happy. Right. You know what I mean? And it means a completely different thing. It didn't stop meaning happy. Like, you could have a gay, gay man. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And, and if you know the, the, the meaning, it's, it, it's a perfectly correct sentence. So then to talk about pain and insult and the potential that we were concerned about offense, and then to truly give what I feel was that sense of putting yourself as much as you could in somebody else's shoes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's feedback that we got from an artist who said, frankly, these images are painful mm -hmm. to me, and I don't know how involved I could be in this exhibit. I thought, well, I know of an artist who's created some role reversal paintings, yes. <laughs> and I thought, well, if 
potentially a black person walking or a person of color walking into this exhibit can feel offended or threatened mm -hmm. that we needed to, unfortunately, we needed to put that experience out Amen. there for people who are white. And so therefore, we have some of your work. You want to talk about your work? Um, and that's not the only type of work. No, you but you said it. I like the setup. The setup was perfect for me because that's what, you know, it was, it was during the time of George Floyd. Um, and, and, and watching like the rest of the planet, watching him die slowly on, on, on right. TV and, and Technicolor, you know what I mean? For all to see. And I, I was exploding. I'm a black man. I live in America. I've had conversations with the police. So I was exploding. And I was exploding probably not in all in good ways. Just angry. And so for me, I needed to figure out a way exactly what you're talking about. I needed to, to figure out a way to have the white people who were still not understanding it, to get it. And to me, it's like, I'm tired of, of talking and going, but don't you have a son too? And what would you do? Because it seems like that doesn't hit. So I was like, what if I just reverse the roles? So I just literally went into history books and got images from American history, and I just, I just flipped them. Were there white people? I put black people on there. Black people that so are hanging, with the hanging, like this one here that's called Sunday morning. Everything in it, including the emotion on the faces, I just kept, I just switched the people. Mm -hmm. And the minute people started seeing that, and for me so far, I've gotten the most interesting reactions from black people. Because it seems they're so, we're so stuck in the way we, we've been told things are, that when we see something that challenges the image, the reactions can be a little crazy. And they have been, mm -hmm. they, they have definitely been. So the last thing I'll talk about is you, I just want people to know that you're not only a visual artist mm -hmm. and a teaching artist, but you're a poet as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, and maybe that'll be our, the last thing we'll um, talk about today. <laughs> poet, I'm a, uh, I, uh, my desire to uh, put, put everything out, and it, it, everything ties to me, everything ties back, like I, figured out a long time ago that the best version of me would be the one that's really super honest with himself. And inside of me is everything. So, you know, people, I've had, I've had everybody, black people, black people come at me and, because my, my, I have a 31 year old, is half white. And his mother is an alabaster, alabaster white, uh, uh, straw, hay, hay, blonde, haired. Midwestern American woman, like probably the definition of American woman, six generations back. And people go like, wow, I have a... And for me, I love that that's how my, my, my journey went because there was a time when I was doing that sort of white people, this, this, that in the universe, sent me to college on a football scholarship where there were no black women around. And then I had a child with a white sister. And that, it was the first time the universe made me go, you gotta look at people from more than how they look on the outside. And that, as a 19 year old, I knew that I was having that conflict because now we try to be a couple and I'm, I'm, worried, I'm realizing that I feel weird when I'm out with her and I'm like son and people are looking at me. I'm realizing that I'm affected by that and that's making me, it's affecting our relationship. And maybe probably it was the reason we broke up a bit too. Coming out of that now with this son, who now at 31 years old looks at me and go, and I ain't black, I'm mixed. Mm. And watching him come to terms with those things. And then being able to tell him, son, I didn't tell you you were black because of, of badness. I told you you were black because, because I saw the way the world bastardized that part of you, roughed up that part of you, you know what I'm saying, and destroyed that part. So I want to do to empower that component, the, the, your black. I want you to understand because. The white part of you, you the history books already said it's awesome. But I wanted you to also realize that being black, and he was like, yeah, you're right, Dad. So, you know, and, and so we, we kind of came to this, this place, but that's like the core of my, of my poetry. That, that we were able to, uh, to talk about um, us and, and bring us to the, to the front. So uh, the thing that, I guess, the one piece that comes out is always talking about those old people. So I'll go, uh, he sits to me like a tide of a warrior contemplating his youth, of battles lost and won and of his search for truth. Imagining myself as him and traveling back in time to see American technicolored black and white. 
And Ku Klux Klan burn crosses in the night in response to a black demands on Newton, southern magnolias were dead, castoted, peculiar fruit. When Jim Crow Sancho does our water fountains and before Martin Luther climbed his mountains to all of this and publish more of this old man who sits next door. With skin so full of melanin, the salt must have been rough for him. He must have swallowed all his pride to take American stride and still be here at 86. In spite of all the stones and sticks they used to try to break our bones and hoof his taps on Huey's phones and all the blood that spilled and run from Huey's manufactured guns and all the lying presidents and all the times they raised the rent and all the blacks to war they sent to die for them and all the sell-out black leaders who lied for them. To all of this, this old man walked and still to sit and hear him talk his strength remains, his pride remains, his love remains, his pride, it remains. He died this year, but I will not forget. And that poem is, uh, I grew up in the projects in Stanford, and three doors down, was just, there's an old man that I would see every day. And he would come out, and uh, it was right when I got home, from, got back from school, so college, so uh, 21, 22, and, you know, so I would come and see mommy a lot. And, um, he would sit, we would greet each other every day, like the way my, I was taught to greet elders in the Caribbean. And good afternoon, sir, good evening, sir. And one day he said, and I went and I sat down, and uh, he said, I love the way you move, young man. Don't let any of this S-H-I-T-O here get to you. Keep doing what you're doing. And we sat and we started talking. And the story, the, I wrote that poem the day his daughter knocked on my back door crying and told me he passed away. Yeah. And, uh, and that was after maybe a year of our relationship growing. And what I noticed was that he would get up every day and he would put, I could feel a choke up coming, and he would put his, uh, he would get dressed, he would iron his clothes. You could smell, my grandfather would tell us, so I know, you'd see the crease down the, down the side of the shirt, you'd see the crease down the pants. And he'd put his, put his shirt in his pants and wore a baseball cap all the time. And he just looked like a man who still took amazing pride in himself. He was black as a man and tall, six foot four. He would walk in the projects. He would walk the street and he'd walk and just walk like a, you know what I'm saying? And I, I watched that and, 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 and then to hear the story of running from being chased by the Klan in the 50s mm. and, and, and growing up in the South and the hopelessness and to, to talk about how he moved here to, to Connecticut and, and raise his family and never ever lost his sense of man and pride and human beingness in the face of the things that the story he told me. I remember one story walking in and, he, and he's from deep in South Carolina. He's walking on some road and he sees a truck following him. And he's like 15 years old and, and he has no idea what to do. And, and uh, he starts running and they catch him. And, and in almost this playful way, they keep they kept him there asking him questions for like 10 minutes of it for like three days. And then told him that he better not be out here, that he shouldn't, a nigga like him should be out here this time of day. And he lived in that area. And I'm watching this man tell the story. This is him as an 80 something year old man. He was 85 when he was 86. And I'm watching this man tell the story, and I'm seeing the fear on this man's face still. And here we are. You know what I mean? So to me, I, I, I applaud you so much for, for this and having the bravery to do this. And I'm, any, anything I can do to help push this and any conversation I can help facilitate or be a part of on this subject, this is how America gets fixed. This is I how we so. fix ourselves. Mm -hmm. This we have, and, and it's not just this conversation. You gotta talk to women too. Because the, 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 the original thing was, you, you, if you're a white man who owned property, you can vote. That's who wrote mm -hmm. the rules of this country. We gotta talk about those mm -hmm. things. It's just common sense. Mm -hmm. Like imagine if men decided what well, our kids were learning in school today. I don't want my kids in the school system. Everybody gotta have a role in it. So when you hear somebody like Biden say he wants his 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 his, uh, his, his cabinet to look like America, again another one of those things you're like, I hope this is that time mm -hmm. when America steps into her her trees. Because mm -hmm. that's the point. Right, so this is a, like I said, this is, I told you, this is the only platform I know that I have that I could bring these conversations mm -hmm. together. And I also know that, like you said, for some people, these conversations were too painful to mm -hmm. have. And I appreciate that you are willing to Absolutely. go there. And I just want to thank everyone. And then I want to say, please keep an open mind. 
Um, please read the other materials that we have and the videos that we've linked onto the website. And if you can come to the exhibit, we'd appreciate that too. Thank you very much. Awesome.